Please welcome back Werner Herzog. <laughs> so, uh, Werner, you told me that when you began this film, or when you, when maybe Raphael uh, first came to you with this idea, that you didn't have any funding for it. You just wanted to get in and 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 do it. Can you talk about that kind of compulsion that you had to just start making this film? Well, I'm not compulsive, but I. Uh, understand if something comes with uh, real vehemence, I have to take action. I cannot duck in the trenches. And we started very quickly. There was no preparation or not much preparation. It was like a road movie. And I financed it out of my pocket. Uh, later, the Sloan Foundation stepped in when I was almost uh, done shooting. And... Um, so uh, it's, it's, a, it's one of those films that uh, can be done fairly easily. And I didn't need much uh, preparation because many of the ideas or so have been floating around in my head. And um, also the um, kind of selection of uh, scientists and labs uh, didn't come from me, but from Rafael Juste. We just organized it into a West Coast uh, voyage and then an East Coast uh, road trip. And um, <clears throat> it may sound odd to you because many of you are filmmakers here. I did not meet anyone who is on screen more than one hour in my entire life. Except, a few exceptions of course, uh, Raphael Juste and very few others, but uh, some of them, like, for example, Corey Bartman and her husband, um, I think Richard Axel, uh, I met uh, 30 or 40 minutes only on camera, which quickly put up the tripod, started to film, and um, I basically knew what they were doing. And I have never met them before and never after. So uh, it, these things... Uh, have to be done just on the run. And can you talk about your interviewing technique? Uh, so no interviews, no, no, no. That's what journalists do. <laughs> I'm a poet. <laughs> yes, it, it's not funny. I'm a poet. And uh, of course, there's uh, documentary films that are part of journalism which is legitimate and okay, but I've been saying it for a long, long time. If you really want to go into something deeper, into something that illuminates you, that gives you uh, entrance into some deeper stratum of truth, you have to divorce yourself from journalism. You have to get away from journalism. Be a poet, be somebody who is just burning inside. Uh, so... Um, that's, that's what I do. There are no interviews. I had never a written uh, catalog of question, questions. It's just my curiosity. So, for instance, Jamie Daves, uh, who's here when you were uh, interviewing Jamie. No, he, not interviewing. Uh, <laughs> you're having, when you're having a poetic conversation with, uh, with Jamie, uh, you asked him about uh, dancing with hummingbirds. Yes, and the answer was so instantly, yes, he says. Uh, and then uh, uh, he starts to think about dancing uh, with a hummingbird. And for a moment I thought, uh, I should, what should I say next? And something shouted in, in, inside of myself, shut up. So I shut up and, and just waited and let uh, Jamie dream about his dance with a hummingbird and it's one of my very very favorite moments in the entire film just because I shut up and because I had no further questions so you just you just let let it happen and and of course I put some uh, music on it which is based on Schubert's Notturno and uh, all of a sudden you have uh, a moment where you look uh, deep into a soul, into the soul of, of, a, of a human being. And in such short time, it's I think seven or eight minutes with uh, Jamie Daves, and all of a sudden you, you have the feeling and you know you're looking inside the, the heart of a man. 
and that's uh, what what we should do and we should not just uh, um, ch have a checklist of, of questions. That's why I'm so vehemently against uh, the, the term interviews, because that's journalism. Um, you mentioned in your introduction that we have one of the human rights uh, specialists that you interviewed uh, in the audience. Can you talk about your interest in the human rights side of, of brain research? It, it came uh, <clears throat> while doing the film. And <clears throat> at the very beginning, <clears throat> sorry, at the very beginning, I didn't know how far uh, the questions were going into um, into ethical questions and questions of our own agency. But of course, it started to dawn on me very quickly when I, for example, spoke to um, the Israeli uh, scientist Uri Hassan at. Uh, I think, where was it, uh, Princeton University. And uh, I, I, can, I can see with my own eyes how he starts to read sorts of storytelling. How would you continue the story? And you can read it and you can define it. And I said to myself, my goodness, uh, what happens if some rogue CIA or whatever other rogue element is going to implant something in, in my brain and, uh, and uh, discover everything, all dark secrets. You should keep dark secrets dark and secret. <laughs> and um, so, of course, uh, that's a big, big question. And uh, I'm asking myself, even if we have a new human rights up, human right articulated, it will only give us a certain amount of protection because we have the Geneva Convention and still <clears throat> there are things going on in, in actual wars that should not happen according to the convention. And we do have uh, certain things, ban, a ban of landmines, which is almost universally adopted. Uh, significantly so, the United States has not, is not participating. So uh, there will be always actors who are staying outside and they may do f funny things with landmines. I don't like the idea of landmines and no, no individual uh, human being on this planet would like the idea of landmines. And yet <clears throat> you cannot get rid completely. Uh, let me take a couple questions uh, from the audience. Uh, here's a hand up right here. Yeah. Thank you very much for a wonderful film. Um, you said you, when, you, when you went at your subject, though, you seem to have put an emphasis on the physiological side. Uh, it seems that in our society, uh, thought is also being, uh, attention is directed through social media and social media algorithms. Uh, did you make a conscious decision not to go in that direction? Is it something mm. completely separate? Yeah. yeah, why didn't I go into the uh, algorithms and things that are going on in social media? Uh, I'm not on social media. I do not like uh, to be part of it, and that's why I don't have a cell phone, for example, because I like to uh, derive my nexus and my understanding of reality in a different way by, for example, traveling on foot or by reading. I mean reading books, not reading tweets. <clears throat> and understanding a landscape, not through a GPS system, but by uh, looking at the formation of a landscape and, and reading, reading the essence of it. So it's a different way for me. and. Uh, the um, social media and the algorithms that dominate it uh, are um, uh, vile and debased and uh, depraved. And we have to be very, very careful how we are handling it. Hi. Uh, here's a woman right, uh, in the brain. Oh. Hi. Hi, Um I was curious about the mind itself, like intentive mind, meditating mind. The mind as a tool and the weapon itself. You know, like when we really focus and do something. Did you want Why to? Don't. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. 
Um, I was asking a question about the mind itself. Mind as a focus tool, mind as an intention tool. Is anyone measuring intention? or Maharishi effect about meditating people, you know, not just the science towards the mind, but the mind itself and how it maybe births the world. Thank you. Well, we, we don't know what the mind is. We don't know what a thought is. And we do not know what consciousness is. Although in, in Eastern philosophy and religions, there's a claim to understand what consciousness is. I doubt uh, that anyone can give an answer from that side either, and uh, I, I, don't, I don't know about meditation because I do not meditate. You see, I, I rather pre meditating means to empty your mind, to uh, have some sort of a, a nothingness in in you and calm down. The techniques, I have no clear idea, but I personally prefer people who, uh, for example, read, get information, come up with a coherent idea and uh, have a conversation with me then. So, And, and by the way, um, there's, there are these ideas floating around that through meditation uh, we can create world peace. It's not going to happen like that. <laughs> All right, I'll take uh, one more question right here. What do you think the, I'll repeat. Can you speak up, please? What do you think the, the relationship between thinking and cinema is? And additionally, do you think a, a true stream of consciousness film is possible? So what do you think the relationship between thinking and cinema is? And do you think a true stream of consciousness film is possible? Um, <laughs> That's a deep question. We, we would need a few days to, to debate it. Uh, but um, I think cinema itself uh, is in, um, in, a, in a delicate relationship with ideas, almost uh, a contrast. Uh, ideas are normally not very good for, for movies. Uh, movies are functioning differently and they have their own dynamic, their own laws, their own storytelling, their own f flow of consciousness. Um, yes, some of, some of it is possible, and I have done a few things like that. Uh, a film like Fata Morgana, very early of my films, uh, that was done in 1967. Uh, your parents were not even born yet <laughs> at that time. So, um, and I have done some wild stuff like um, the wild blue yonder. It's um, not a stream of consciousness as because I imposed a story upon footage that, that is normally incompatible with each other and yet I shape it into a story. So there's a stream of, um, of images and storytelling uh, consciousness, I would be careful, but that's a huge, huge, huge subject, and and will never come to an end in our dis in our discourse. So, Werner, you've always been a writer. You published a, a new novel this year. You have a memoir that just came out in Germany. Will eventually be making its way uh, into uh, into English. Um, what what can we expect from that memoir? Well, it's not. Uh, it's not an autobiography, it's more um, some sort of, um, how can I say, um, uh, origins of ideas, for example. And there, all of a sudden there's poetry in it. I have all of a sudden interspersed five ballads of the little soldier because I've been with uh, child soldiers uh, in Honduras, Nicaragua and uh, been on some commando raid with them. And all of a sudden there are some very tragic, although it's in prose, but it's like ballads. And instead of talking much about Akere, the wrath of God, which I have done a lot uh, before, I speak more about a man, an African revolutionary, John Okello, who in the early 1960s, as a very young man, 27 years old, 
declared himself field marshal on the island of Zanzibar and with a ragtag uh, army of, of maybe 30 or so overthrew the, the sultan uh, of, of the island. And he used to deliver completely mad speeches um, over radio and, and so absolutely strange and th threatening. Um, and in, in the media you would see something once in a while uh, under miscellaneous a few lines. But the speeches are so, were so incredible that um, Aguirre's kind of um, monologues are somehow a distant echo of John O'Kello. And I was in contact with him through writing. I tried to find him in Uganda. He disappeared and was apparently murdered by Idi Amin, so I came too late. And I was in trouble because in northern Uganda, where he came from, um, police was very, very suspicious about me and I, I better left very, very quickly because you better don't end up in jail there. Sounds bad. <laughs> Um, well, uh, Werner, I speak uh, on behalf of so many people uh, in gratitude for the films and the books and the ideas that you've brought us uh, over the years. It's uh, it's thrilling to know that there's something new that we'll be able to get our hands on soon, and uh, we just look forward to having you back at this festival again and again for all your future films. So thank you for being here. Thank you, yeah.